We're actually going to be in Ephesians chapter 1 this morning for the sermon on this All Saints Day. Uh, it, it, is, it really is just a gift to be gathered together um, this morning. Uh, we're finishing our five weeks on the core values of Christ the King. So we've looked at hospitality, story, Bible, or the story of the gospel, the Bible, or the authority of Scripture, uh, beauty and imagination last week, and today we look at worship. Worship, the final, uh, the final of our five values. Now we value many other things, and there's overlap, and there's a hundred different ways to talk about every one of these things. Um, but if, if the Bible is the heart of our values as a church, in terms of our practices, our worship centers around it, our, our prayer life and our life together centers around God revealing himself to us in the scriptures. If that is this, the heart of our values, then worship um, is all about where our hearts are pointed to. So if, if Bible is the center of our practice and our liturgy and our prayer life and all these sorts of things, then the Bible and all the rest of our values are aimed at worship and worship is aimed at something. It's always aimed at something like faith or trust or love, worship is about a direction. It's about an aim. It's about an end. And so where are we going is the question of worship. Whom do we love is a worship question. Can I trust him? That's, a, that's an esteem or a value or praise kind of question. Who is the king we want to follow? These are the questions that thinking about worship answers. And so when we hear the word worship, and we think about all of this stuff. That's what we do. We hear worship and we think about this. Now, I want you all to think about this stuff. And we're going to have opportunity to do that and think more fully about it. Why do I wear a robe on Sunday morning? Why do I lift up bread and tear it? Why do I do these kinds of things? Why, why do we make the sign of the cross if we choose to do that? Why do we end every service eating a meal around a table? Why do we do these things? These are good questions, and there's, there, these are things that we think about when we hear the word worship, but worship isn't primarily about an event or a place. It's not primarily about an event or a place. It's about a person. It's about, that, that's where we're aiming to. So when we're talking about worship, we're not primarily talking about stuff. We're talking about who we're worshiping and why we are worshiping. And so if all of this, what we wear and what we say and what we do, if all of this is supposed to point to Jesus, and if it doesn't point to Jesus, then we failed in catechesis and understanding that. But that's not primarily what I want to talk about this morning. So that's a teaser for other, other times and other events and other catechesis where we will break down all these kinds of things this morning, uh, the things that we do in our liturgy. But this morning I want to answer, I want to answer uh, the questions that we have when worship comes into our mind about the forms and the theology of Anglican worship. Uh, we, we're going to answer. We're going to answer those questions in other opportunities. But this morning, I want to answer the question of who who is Jesus? Why do we gather together to worship Him? What is this all about? And so, here's the website definition of our final value of worship: Christian liturgy. And there's a reason I've I've summarized it with the word worship instead of liturgy. Christian liturgy confounds our cultural idols and fosters humble formational worship. Liturgy is not the point. Worship is the point. Okay, so liturgy is not the point. Here's a little bit more from our website definition. Christian liturgy, and that word liturgy just means the work of the people, what we do together in this place. All of it is aimed at including us in worship. Welcome, welcoming, welcoming us into the presence of God and turns our attentions and our heart and our affections toward God. And so there is nothing fashionable about what we do here. There's nothing fashionable about what I'm wearing. I don't dress in any kind of culturally um, esteemable sort of dress, right? There's no nice suit here. There's no holy uh, rock star pants um, or rich person clothes or anything like that. 
Um, nobody leaves this church wanting to dress like me, and that's for a reason. While all of this might be strange at first in terms of these forms, maybe even distracting, we don't do anything here to draw attention to ourselves, just the opposite. So if you give it a few weeks, after a few weeks, all of this isn't like so strange anymore. It's not super strange. And if you give it a few months, you start to not notice any of it. It's just kind of what church is like. It, you, the, the pressure is down, the stress of like, what's Chris going to wear? What's he going to do? Or something like that. All these kinds of things. Uh, what's, what's the worship leader going to say? Are they going to stick their foot in their mouth? The, the going through the liturgy helps to relieve some of those pressures a little bit. And if you give the liturgy a few years and by God's grace, you'll find that you don't come to church to focus on what we're doing, but you come to see God. You're not focusing on the motions and the things. All of that fades away into the background, into your memory, into your heart, so that you can focus on God as revealed in Holy Scripture. As always, C.S. Lewis says it better than we could, any of us could say. Uh, in his letters to Malcolm, he says it like this. It looks as if pastors believed people can be lured to go to church. And this was written in the 1930s and the 1940s. People can be lured to church by incessant brightenings and lightenings and lengthenings and abridgments and simplifications and complications of the service. Novelty, simply as such, can only have an entertainment value, and they don't go to church to be entertained. It sounds like a very modern discussion, doesn't it? They go to use the service, or if you prefer, to enact it, to enact the service. Every service is a structure of acts and words through which we receive a sacrament or repent of our sins or supplicate or a door, and it enables us to do these things best, if you like, it works best when through long familiarity, we don't have to think about it anymore. As long as you notice and have to count the steps, you are not dancing, but you're only learning to dance. All of us are learning to dance the liturgy right now. A good shoe is a shoe you don't notice anymore. Good reading becomes possible when you need not consciously think about eyes or light or print or spelling. Or if you're like me, the dirtiness of your room, you're just lost in the book. The perfect church service, Lewis concludes, would be one where we are almost unaware of it. Our attention would have been on God. So that's... That's kind of beginning to answer the question of liturgy, but we're not going to get in the, the weeds of that because Christian liturgy, as it confounds our cultural idols and fosters humble formational worship, that is the aim of all of this. It's worship. In God's providence, there is no better way to speak about worship than on this day, the Feast of All Saints. This is a really great day to talk about worship. This is All Hallows Day. Another way to say that is the feast of all the holy ones. Holy ones, hallows. We, are, we were on the Hallows Eve or Halloween yesterday, and today we're on the feast of all saints. So today, in churches all over our nation, there are sermons being preached right now about values, like, like this church, but it's probably sermons values as related to the current events of our day, biblical values as it relates to our politics. Many churches and many people on this, the Lord's Day, are not fixated on Sunday. They're looking at Tuesday. They're looking two days ahead. And one of the gifts of Christian liturgy and that this day falls on this day for me is that I don't have to work myself up and not to come up with something to say that feels relevant to you. I'm not really interested in that primarily. I want to preach about uh, this, the Feast of All Saints, using the lectionary text that we're giving to us. 
We don't have to be a slave to the news cycle. We don't have to order our lives by a national calendar. There are many things that we thankfully receive as Anglicans, and one of those gifts is the church calendar. And so rather than pattern our year by school semesters or by seasonal shopping days, which get longer and longer, and there are more and more special events, more, it's crazy, I don't understand it all. Um, when are you supposed to get deals? I don't really know actually anymore. I think it's every day, I don't know. Uh, or national elections. Uh, we have the opportunity with the church calendar to shape our lives around the life of Christ, about his advent, about his growing up, about his ministry, about his, his life and his death and his resurrection, and then how that is reflected in the church and we we think about and we reflect on his finished work in so many different ways over and over again every week every year whether there is a national election or not today november 1st is a feast day it's always a feast day today is the day to celebrate and remember the great cloud of witnesses as the writer of hebrew says who have gone before us and who walk with us and so here's the question why, if we're finishing our, our series on worship as a value, am I talking about all saints? What do those have to do with each other? What does this feast of all saints have to do with worship? And that's the question that Ephesians 1, uh, which was going to be one of our readings this morning, uh, answers. Okay, So I'm actually going to read Ephesians 1, and thankfully I was already going to do it with a very a West Virginia and probably Oklahoma more approved translation uh, from myself. Okay, say so. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter one. I encourage you to look at your your Bible with me as I read through it. Ephesians chapter one. We're going to have three alliterated points. The first two are alliterated, and I was stretching for the third one because it just it just worked. Okay, so first we're going to see eulogy. Second, we're going to see Eucharist, and third, we're going to see ecclesia. Okay. Eulogy, Eucharist, and Ecclesia. So the first point, eulogy, or our, our shared inheritance. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 11. In him, in Christ, we have obtained, have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him, y'all also, when y'all heard the word of truth, the gospel of y'all's salvation, and believed, plural, you together believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. We're very familiar with this text. Believe it or not, these four verses are the end of one very long sentence in this letter that begins in verse 3 with these words. Eulogatos ha theos. Eulogy about God. Okay, The blessed... Blessed be, that this word blessed or praise or honor or worship or esteem, eulogy, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is how this sentence begins. And this big sentence is a eulogy. It's a eulogy, a statement of worship and praise to the Father. Praising him for what? What is he praising him for? He's praising them, him for our shared inheritance. What is our shared inheritance in verses 3 through 14 that is gifted, that our shared inheritance uh, through God our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ that is gifted and sealed and given to us by the Holy Spirit? What is the shared inheritance? It's, it's the gospel. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14 is one of the most beautiful articulations and uh, poetic and liturgical, and, and it's just so layered. It's such a beautiful articulation of the gospel. Paul is eulogizing God for the gospel. God the Father, before the foundation of the world, 
ordained and sent his holy and blameless son, Jesus Christ, to redeem all of us together. And Paul calls us, this is one of my favorite phrases, he calls us together, the beloved, the beloved of God, saved by grace. We are redeemed by his blood, forgiven of our sins because of his grace, lavish, lavished with an immense inheritance according to the riches of his grace. That's where our sermon text starts. This eulogy, this is our shared inheritance. In Christ, we are adopted children of our Heavenly Father. And because we are sons, because we are daughters, we are also heirs of his fullness, of his inheritance. We receive it all. So hear me, child of the King. God gives you everything in Christ. That is how this letter begins. Why are you worried about Tuesday? Praise God for our shared inheritance. This is the beginning. This is the beginning. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It all, it all goes on top of each other. It all layers together what we talked about last week. We start with eulogy, and then we move, secondly, to Eucharist. With Paul, we, sh we, sh we move to Eucharist, or our shared thanksgiving. Look with me at verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 1. For this reason, because I have heard of y'all's faith in the Lord Jesus and y'all's love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for y'all, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give y'all the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of y'all's hearts enlightened, and y'all may know what is the hope to which you have been called. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? The first big sentence goes from verse 3 to verse 14. And the second big sentence begins in chapter 15 and it goes through the end of the chapter. And it begins with this word, for this reason, for this reason. What reason? Remember, because of our, our, our shared inheritance in Christ. This eulogy of Paul, because of this gift, give thanks. That's the necessary response. Because of the eulogy, Eucharist, because of the praise of God for the gospel and the beauty of the gospel and our shared inheritance in Christ, because of Christ's work, give thanks. This is the pattern of nearly every one of Paul's letters. It's over and over again, all over the place. Praise Jesus Christ for the gospel and then give thanks. Now, you might have noticed by now my comical translations of the text. And the reason I'm doing that, in case you haven't, you haven't noticed all of the y'alls, the annoying y'alls in this text, we often don't read this text in a collective sense, which is what Paul is intending for us to do. It is our shared inheritance, all of us together, our salvation. It's not, it's not a me and Jesus kind of thing. The redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ is for all the saints. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, as Paul says. And so now, today, is the perfect time to pause and unpack the, important, the importance of the Feast of All Saints. This is where worship is coming together with this feast day, this All Saints Day. Paul begins his letter with love for God, with eulogy and praise for him, and then he moves directly into love of neighbor. Love for God, love for neighbor. We say this every Sunday when we come together. I say this over us. What's, what is the first commandment, right? And the second is like it. We love God eulogize God, we praise God, and then we respond with thanksgiving, with Eucharist for God and for all the saints. And why does Paul give thanks for them? Why does he give thanks for them? Because, Paul says, he heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all the saints. So he gives thanks for them, for their, their faith in God, for their eulogy, for their worship of God, and for their love of the saints. Paul, 
Paul, he, he, he loves them because of their double love for God and for neighbor. And, and he, he, is, he loves them for that. It's like this circular, never stopping, never ending. Saint means holy one. Saint means holy one. And holiness, holiness in the Bible is about devotion. Worship is about direction. And devotion is about direction. So in scripture, you can be holy towards an idol. You can be holy towards Baal. Or you can be holy towards God. And so Paul begins his letter with praise to God for the gospel. And immediately he gives thanks for all those in Ephesus who are devoted to God because of the gospel. Holy ones, hallowed ones, saints, devoted ones. Don't let this language make you feel awkward. It just means people whose hearts and minds are directed to Jesus Christ in love and worship. To give thanks. For a saint is to give thanks for a devoted one, is to give thanks to God for our shared thanksgiving in Christ. It's this big circular love fest. It's beautiful. We esteem a man because of his devotion to the God man. We give thanks or Eucharist for all the saints because their faith in God and for all the saints. And in case I'm repeating the repetition here, Eulogy always leads to Eucharist, which always leads back to eulogy and repeat. Always. It repeats over and over again. Worship the holy God. Give thanks for the holy God on display in his holy ones. And then do it again. And then do it again. Every Sunday at this table, we receive the holy Eucharist. That's what we call it. The holy Eucharist. The great thanksgiving is what it's often called. The great thanksgiving devoted to God the Father because of Christ Jesus the Son in the table fellowship which is sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. That's what Holy Eucharist means. Every Sunday I say these words at this table, and I'm going to say them in a few minutes. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in, in this what? In this sacrifice of what? Praise and thanksgiving. That's, that's eulogy and Eucharist. We offer you these gifts. So every Sunday, a sacrifice happens at this table. Every Sunday, a sacrifice happens. But it's not a re-sacrificing of Christ. This is not a transubstantiation kind of thing. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. We don't re-sacrifice him on Sundays. We remember and we proclaim. There is no transubstantiation. This isn't a Catholic thing, a Roman Catholic thing. There is only shared Eucharist. We come together to offer our sacrifice of eulogy and Eucharist of praise and thanksgiving. And this is a simple and humble kind of gift, like a child bringing back something to their father. Just to, it's a child's gift to their father. It's Eucharist. So eulogy moves to Eucharist, and then finally, ecclesia, or our shared inheritance on display. Our shared inheritance on display. Look with me at verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 1. That... All of this, all of this redemption accomplished and this thanksgiving proclaimed that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. I encourage you. To picture the scene that Anne read for us from Revelation chapter 7. With all the saints and the angels around the throne worshiping God and the Lamb. This is, this is what Paul is talking about. Verse 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1.23 is, is perhaps one of the most shocking statements in all of the Bible. It's, it's, it is always shocking to me that Paul can say, 
that the fullness of the Father and the Son and the redemption that he has accomplished, it's not full and it's not complete yet without the church. The Father who fills the church, the gathering of all saints and worship of God together. This is the fullness of the one who fills. Praise and thanksgiving is on display in the gathering. Don't let church have all these other meanings for you. It just church means those who gather together. Those who gather together, the body together, not the body separated into little parts all over the place, but the the body constituted together. This is what church is. Eulogy and Eucharist is on display in the ecclesia and the church. Christianity is not and cannot be finally a solitary religion. Church means gathering. There's no other way to understand that. Church is fullness for Paul. The gathering is the fullness of the one who fills. It's on display. The fullness of the gospel, which we've eulogized this morning, must be manifest. It has to be manifest in restored fellowship together. In the gathering, there is no other way to manifest the gospel in the world. Our salvation is a shared salvation in Christ. Our worship is a shared worship in Christ. Our thanksgiving is a shared thanksgiving in Christ. And shared not only with the saints on earth, but the saints in heaven. Paul has Jesus in the heavenly places here. Just as John sees in Revelation chapter 7, which we heard this morning. It is here. It is in this gathering Gathered together on the Lord's day that all the saints proclaim the everlasting dominion of Christ, the king who sits at the right hand of the father. He's ruling and reigning over heaven and earth. It is here on earth that we gather around a table wearing white robes, bringing an offering of praise and thanksgiving, remembering at the same time that we are joining with saints in heaven who are alive in Christ. Not dead people. People who are alive in Christ, waiting the resurrection like us, gathered around the throne of God and the Lamb, wearing white robes, bringing an offering of praise and thanksgiving. We sing these songs, we say this liturgy, and we share this meal with all the saints. All saints. In heaven and on earth, alive in Christ. That's our only life right now anyway. Don't you know that? This, this is our life. In heaven and on earth, all of us together awaiting the return of the king who will one day reun- reunite fully heaven and earth. What, what is coming together here at this place, around this table, together in this fellowship of worship is a picture of what is all going to be reunited one day around the Lord's banqueting table. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what we do here. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. That's why we pray that on Sundays. That, that, is, that is a little remembrance, and this is a bigger remembrance. That's what, that's what the Feast of All Saints is about. It's not about praying to saints. It's not, about, it's not about some kind of weird distraction from Jesus. It's all fundamentally about pointing to Jesus. That's what a saint is. It's one who is devoted, who is holy to the Lord. That's what saint means. There's, that's, that's what the word means. Someone who's devoted to the Lord. And so this is why Paul can say, follow after me as I follow after Christ. He didn't want him to fall after him in his sinfulness. But as he, as, he, as he approaches God, as he devotes himself to the Lord, Paul says, I wish that you all could be like me. All be single like me so that you could devote yourself wholly to the Lord. 
That's what Paul says. That's what we're doing here. And with all the saints, we celebrate Jesus, the Lion and the Lamb, in the Feast of All Saints. So we worship the King. All of this is coming together in worship. We worship the King with united voices in worship, saints and angels with one voice in restored fellowship around the table of our Lord. There is no hope. There is no life for the world without eulogy and Eucharist united in the ecclesia. There isn't. This is, this is the thing that we need to replicate into all the world. Praise of Jesus, worship of Jesus above all things, and giving thanks and restored fellowship around the table. That's what we're doing. That's the end. That's the end of hospitality. That's the end of the gospel proclamation, the story of the scriptures. That's why we come back to the Bible over and over again. That's why we seek beauty and imagination in this world is to lead more and more people into restored fellowship with God and with each other because of the gospel. Worshiping God for this beautiful, this beautiful inheritance that we share. So won't you come? Won't you come this morning and receive and believe the good news? And I'm going to quote from uh, I'm going to quote from the 79 prayer book because this is how I remember it. This is how I want to end this morning. Let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our maker. For we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. O oh, come, let us adore him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.